Today I'm going to show you one node tree that if you know it, you can translate any camera or any footage straight into the enhancer and start using it right away. So my name is Colin Osbury. I'm a filmmaker based in the DC area and I've been using Dehancer for the last several months. They have a very extensive guide on the Dehancer website. I've spent a lot of time in it. I've also spent hours and hours fumbling around within the plugin. So I hope to save you that time on the front end so you can just jump straight in. So I'm gonna be using a B-Raw workflow today. I'll show you the raw workflow. If you're not using raw, that's totally okay. There's a lot of other ways to translate any footage from any camera straight into Rec. 709 and then plug that into Dehancer. And I'll show you how to do that. A couple other things. If you're just looking for footage, I don't know if this video is for you. Essentially, I shot a 15 minute video here, just overviewing the plugin, what it does, what it's all about. Go check that out, come back later if you want. Next thing is I'm gonna show you how to take a look that you've made and apply it to multiple different clips. And lastly, the team at Dehancer was kind enough to send me a coupon code for you guys. So I'll share that with you at the end. All right, and welcome to a new project. We got our media tab open. I've just dragged a couple clips from my hard drive into here. We're gonna work with these. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up this project to one, read our B-Raw footage properly and two, to work in a bigger color space so that we're using the most amount of color data and we're gonna funnel that down into a smaller color space. So it all makes sense in a second and also save us a lot of time on the back end. So let's, let's get it. All right, I'm gonna go up to file and then I'm gonna go to project settings. So master settings, I know I'm working with 4K, so I'm just gonna go to ultra HD, all right. And then once we hit color management, I'm going to select DaVinci YRGB. We're not going to do the color manage. We're just going to do original DaVinci YRGB. So make sure this is not checked. We don't need two different color spaces in gammas. So for our timeline color space, we're going to select DaVinci wide gamut and intermediate. So imagine if Rec. 709, which is typical video that you see, is in this big of a color space. DaVinci wide gamut is three times that it's it might even be bigger than airy raw so it's it's absolutely massive um it's a great place to start and as we funnel our footage down the pipeline we're going to export in rec 709. if we start color grading in this small color space we're not going to maximize the footage we're going to be limiting ourselves with the colors and we want to obviously maximize so our output color space is going to be rec 709 gamma 2.4 and the reason for that oops Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. The reason for that is because a lot of displays are Gamma 2.4. So simply put, it's just going to display properly. Gamma 2.4 is what most displays display. Once you learn that, it everything kind of falls into place. <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to learn that. All right. So in Camera Raw, I worked with a Blackmagic Pocket 6K. So I, I shot B Raw. So I'm going to select Blackmagic Raw. If you worked in a different raw workflow, go ahead and select whatever that is here. I'm gonna change this to project. It'll likely be just by default. I'm gonna change this to project and I'm gonna select gen five because I know that I shot in gen five. I also like to check highlight recovery um, just because sometimes your highlights can get overexposed and this will roll them off nicely. It'll just give you an extra kick, extra boost and it's safe. All right, we're like halfway there, congrats. So in the edit tab, I just put some clips in the timeline, just drag them from my media pool over here, easy peasy. And in the color tab, all right. So what you're looking at here is the node tree. I'm gonna pop up a graphic on the screen. This is Dehancer's recommended node tree. It's pretty simple. What I've done is I've taken that and applied my own color grading workflow to it. So to simplify things, I put it into a couple stages. We have the denoiser right here, since we're adding grain Oftentimes it's great to denoise your footage because that'll just give you a cleaner grain. Once you mix color noise and grain in the same image, it can get kind of money. So we like to denoise at times. We have our primary grades right here. We've got white balance, contrast, and saturation and density. I'll explain that in a second. And a lot of time you won't actually use these. So I'm hitting command D to disable these. All right, we have our power windows here. So those are like masks. Say there's a problem area in the highlights. I can put a mask on there, put a power window on there, drag the highlights down and center your attention to the center of the screen, or there's a color I wanna get rid of. That's gonna happen in our power windows. The next one we have here is our skin. We're gonna affect our skin in this node and then everything outside of our skin we can change here and it will be affected. And then we have a layer node here. I'll show you how to set all of this up in a second. We have our color space transform to take really any camera profile and funnel it down into Dehancer if we're not using RAW and we can't find our camera here. Next, we have Dehancer. 
And then we have any additional effects such as sharpen or really anything else you wanna to add to the end. Hardly ever use that one. So as you can see here, there's a couple of the nodes that are labeled with lowercase letters. And I did that because a lot of the time you're not gonna use these. It's gonna be simply denoiser, some power windows, skin tones, and the enhancer. And if you could look closely, I'm not even using any of these. I'm only using Dehancer, one single node, and we're getting this. So, so here's a before and after. All right, I'm gonna re-enable by hitting Command D. All right, so let's start from scratch and we'll build it from there. All right, and to get this view, all I've done is, is collapse the gallery view, and I've just expanded this so that we have a little bit more room to work with. All right, we're starting from complete scratch. Let's build this node tree. All right, I'm gonna hit Option S to add a new node. You can also right click and hit node label if you want to label it and make it nice. So I'm gonna call this denoiser with a capital D because we usually use that. And anything that's really non-essential, and I'll show you why in a second, I'm gonna label in all lowercase, just as a reminder. All right, so I'm gonna add a couple more nodes here, add three more, option S. I'm gonna label this one white balance, this one contrast, and the third one, I'm gonna label saturation slash density. All right, all of our white balance happens here, really a temp and tint. Contrast is really, you know, our gain, maybe our lift, our gamma. When we look at film, we watch movies, we look at stills, the colors aren't just more saturated, they're more dense. And that's why we're gonna affect a lot of our density here after the fact. So an example of that is probably these reds here on digital, they might come across as a little orange, but what we can do is change the luminance value of that color and just bring it down and deepen that color to make it look just like film. So that's why this is labeled density. All right, let's add a new node, option S. I'm gonna label this power windows. All right, another node. And then I'm gonna right click on number six. I'm gonna add a layer node, add a layer node. On this bottom one, I'm gonna label the skin and then I'm gonna label the top one outside. So say we have our film emulation on and our skin tones are looking kind of off. Usually we can tweak that within the parameters in Dehancer, but sometimes you just need to get it on the skin tone line, all right? So I'm gonna go to my scopes down here. I'm gonna drop down to vector scope, and then you can go into these little options here. I'm gonna select two times zoom and show skin tone line. Okay, so once we have that, any anytime you're looking for your skin tones, you're trying to land your skin tones properly, just land them on this line and they're gonna look great. All right, I just set up a quick node tree real quick to show you the skin tone. So I'm gonna label this skin and outside. All right, so the reason we have a layer node here is because once we identify our skin, we go into our little qualifier. I'm gonna drag on here, come up to this mask here and then just kind of qualify the skin by dragging here, isolating it, getting some of our saturation out of the way. This is a rough example, but stick with me. All right, so once I have the skin, I can turn the mask off and I can start to affect it here. So you can see down in the vector scope, we're moving those skin tones around and it's not affecting anything else. It's kind of beautiful. So I'm gonna reset that. And then we have this layer node here because when we select outside, we can affect everything but the skin tones. It's an amazing way to typically get that teal orange look if you like that. And we can move everything around as we please. So once you have Dehancer on and you get the skin the way you like it, you can shift all the other colors in any direction you want. So there you go. All right, back to our, back to our node here. I'm gonna click on the layer mixer and then hit option S again for another node. And I'm gonna label this our CST. Our CST is color space transform. We won't always use a color space transform, but when we do, it's really integral to a non raw workflow. And I'll show you that in a minute. All right, option S again, label this dehancer. Perfect. And then one more time, another node FX. All right, now that we have our node tree, let's go ahead and add Dehancer. I'm gonna click effects up here in the corner, type in Dehancer and drag and drop onto our Dehancer node. I'm gonna change this film profile real quick, just to Portra 400 to get us started. A lot of these nodes are labeled in lowercase because I'm working in a raw workflow and I'm, I might not use these. 
So I'm going to hit Command D to disable them. After this, what we're going to do is we're going to right click and we're going to save this template grade to apply to our other clips just to get us jump started to save a lot of time. So I'm going to come over here to the clip. I'm going to grab still, come over to our gallery. I've done this a couple of times, but I'm going to label this start here. And if I could spell, there we go. So next time I'm ready to start from scratch, I can click on another shot, right click on one of our gallery stills over here, hit apply grade, and we're ready to start grading. Easy peasy. So now that we're ready to start grading, I'm gonna show you our end product. This is what I graded in my review of the Sigma 1835. This is kind of the look that I went for. It's nice and warm, yet still feels a little natural. Now that I've regraded it, <laughs> I want to probably use a different film print. Uh, it's the Fuji film print. It just takes a little bit of the warmth and leans it toward green. I like that, especially when you see like natural trees in the back, like pine trees and stuff. Uh, Fuji's just really pleasing. So I might actually take it that direction, but this is essentially the grade that we'll be doing. All right, I've applied the start here grade and we're ready to start grading. Okay, so since I worked in a raw workflow, we have access to our camera raw controls down here. So this will likely be set to project, but I'm gonna change this to clip. So I have some access into these. And what I wanna do is I wanna check my ISO to see if it's 400 or 3200. The reason I wanna do that is because 400 and 3200 are the Pocket 6K's native ISOs. They're gonna be the cleanest. They're not gonna have a ton of noise. Every other ISO in between that is gonna be kind of digitally boosted and it's gonna add a lot more noise. So I wanna work with one of the natives. So now that I have Dehancer on this clip, we're gonna to go to the input controls here. I'm gonna change this to choose camera and then Blackmagic Design, 6K and Gen 5 ISO 400. So we're already in a really good spot. <laughs> like that looks cool. Sometimes you'd stop there, you know? So Dehancer recommends first and foremost, I kind of an order of operations. You're gonna see in a second that there's a lot of different ways to change your exposure. Why would they do that? because they all affect different things in different ways. But Dehancer recommends using the camera raw controls, adjusting these within here, the color temp, the tint, exposure, saturation, all of these highlight roll off before changing the inputs because the camera raw tools at your disposal are so much more powerful at affecting the source clip. It's gonna be the cleanest and it's gonna get you the best result. So we're gonna do a lot of our grading down in here. But again, in our template, we have some of these options in here, these primary grades, just in case we need them later on. Okay, so I kind of like the white balance. I'm good with that. I'm good with the tint so far. I'm gonna come over here to the waveform. I have a decent amount of contrast, so that's a really great place to start. I don't have to really adjust too many of these. I'm gonna make sure highlight roll off is clicked because I like how it looks and make sure I'm in Gen 5 and that matches up here, Gen 5, awesome. The format and the camera profiles that Dehancer has built are super accurate. So we wanna start there. If your camera isn't in there, I'm gonna show you how to convert your footage into a workflow that works within Dehancer. I'll share that after this. So now that we've selected our camera, I'm gonna come down to film and I'm gonna select my film. I like Kodak Vision 350D a lot. That's the one I chose for my grade, but a couple others, the Portra 400 looks really clean. I like the saturated colors. Um, these Vision 3 films are essentially what movies are shot on, and then they're printed on a Kodak 2383 film stock. So we have access to that, and that's super exciting. They look awesome. Kodak Gold is fun. Uh, obviously, you can see it added a lot of red in there. Um, I also like to use Kodak Ektar. I think that one's fun. And then Fuji Color. 1600, really, really clean, especially with the pine trees back there. I love to see that. I'm gonna collapse the timeline here. Kind of make this a little bigger. All right. Fuji Color 100 is awesome. There's so many films. That's the point. There's so many to choose from. Cine Still is fun to play with, just to experiment with. 800T looks amazing all of a sudden. So I'm gonna go with Kodak Vision 350D. I like that film stock a lot and it it's just nice. So as you can see, there are a couple of these tools that are collapsed. That's because Dehancer is self-aware and they realize you're not gonna use that all the time. 
a lot of the time when you're developing film, you're not really going to change the development process, like the chemicals within it, the, the density of the chemicals, like you just won't change that. So it kind of reflects the actual lab, which I appreciate. But we can come up into Film Developer. I'm going to enable it here. And I'm going to just add a little bit more contrast. Gamma correction, as you can see in our scopes down here, is going to affect our midtones. We're essentially telling our midtones where to go. Okay. Color separation is awesome. And then color boost is really saturation. Color separation is going to affect our most dense colors while leaving everything else kind of untouched. So if we drag that down, you can see the reds and the railing kind of coming up at 100. I like to boost that to 100. Color boost is going to play with our saturation a little bit. All right. All right, the next thing we're going to do is select our print. This, these are really the heart and soul of the answer. It's the film and the print. So again, we have our film that we're shooting on, and then we have either the paper or the film stock that we're printing it on, and we select that here. So linear is going to be the absolute cleanest look. It's not going to be affected by like Kodak Glossy, which is a little bit more saturated. Linear is going to be the best way to start so that I can really see truly what the film looks like not being affected by the print. Another popular one is the Kodak 2383 print film. A lot of the movies that we see today that are shot on film are printed on this film stock. So I'm gonna put a graphic up on the screen. You can see that the film is shot, it's brought into the lab, it might be digitized, and then once it's color graded, it's printed onto this Kodak print film stock, which looks really, really cool. So again, here's Lanier, more saturated, and then we have our print film, which looks so awesome. Um, like I was saying earlier, I like the Fujifilm one a lot for this, just because it adds in nice blues and greens, and it, it really does a great job with that. I think the reds come down with the Fuji print film, but I'm gonna do the Kodak print film just because, goodness gracious, it just looks so good. All right, so here we can affect our target white point, which is awesome. So as you can see, it's changing our white point from warm to cool. So I'm gonna make this more neutral. I'm not gonna really affect that. We can adjust our exposure here if we need to. Again, this is a little bit different from the exposure controls down here. Uh, this is <laughs> the source clip and then the exposure tools here in print are for the print itself. So just with all of these, just feel free to do a lot of experimentation and get some cool looks. Tonal contrast is going to be the highs and the lows. Where do I want those to land? I don't want the shadows to fall out too far. So I'm gonna bring this down. And sometimes it's really a dance between these two sliders right here. You're probably gonna use these a lot. You're gonna see this color density slider twice. And I like to bring this all the way up to 100 because it really makes a lot of the deepest colors just more dense. I, it's hard to explain in words, but it's not just saturation. It's not just bringing the colors up. It's really making those colors deep. And that's why we like film colors so much. So I like to really maximize that. And I'll take a still here and I'll play this just so you can see side by side what I'm talking about. All right. So one is at 50 and another is at 100. So look at this orange up here on this building. See I'm swiping it. And then look at the bridge at the reds. This is without color density up and this is with color density added. It just makes it look awesome for lack of a better word sometimes you can't really explain it you just got to feel it analog range limiter is cool because sometimes you can overdo it and then if you click this it'll just shrink your image down into a more natural maybe filmic film stocky look so i like to click that sometimes i'm going to leave that off i'm going to go ahead and turn film grain off so we can get a clean look at the grade before we move forwards so I'm gonna jump in film compression because I like where the sky's at, but I wanna bring that down a touch, all right? So I'm gonna enable this. See when I enable this, the sky comes down into a nice spot. So I'm gonna turn up the impact just a little bit, drag our white point up to the top of the 896 line right here, and then impact the tonal range a little bit. Play with this. All right, I like where that's at. Let me bring it down a little bit so it brings our attention more to the center of the frame rather than up at the sky. And then here we have color density again. I like to push this to 100. 
It's really subtle, but I think it adds a ton to the grade and makes it stand out from just really any of the tools that you can use within your primary grades. All right, so expand is really important here because that is again gonna set our highs and our lows and really doing a dance in here, we can start to set our levels again. It's really just coming back and forth to each of the tools and playing around. Say you overcompensate in one area, you're, you're gonna come back to expand a lot of the time. So once I get this to a good level, I'm gonna come down to color head. Within here, these are simple creative changes. Say I want to add more warmth or cool it off or add more tint, make it add more green, add more magenta. I'm gonna do that in my raw controls. This is essentially adding you know, yellow to the shadows, adding blue to you know, the highlights, whatever, whatever you wanna do, those creative decisions are gonna happen in here, not necessarily your massive overhaul grades, your corrections. All right, so I can change the color of the midtones. You can really, I mean, just so subtly dial in that look and I don't want it to be too cool. So I might add a little bit of warmth. You can see to the shadows, looks awesome. Here's the opposite end, cool to the shadows. I'm gonna bring it up to warm. Looks really nice. And then you can gang these together, which is nice. But sometimes you might be able to adjust an overcorrection. So like that, so subtle. So there's without, there's with, just corrected that just a touch. So now that I have my look dialed in, I'm gonna come down to film grain. Once I enable this, I like to go to about 65 because I like a finer grain um, and I'm not trying to overdo it, but I definitely want to add some texture to the shot. So I, I typically dance between 35 millimeter. So in this look and then 65, uh, similar look, probably the 250 ISO. Once I get that, and this guy's cracking me up right here. Once I get that, I'm gonna come up to custom and I can start to dial in these these parameters. What's cool is that you can affect the shadows, the highlights, the midtones differently. For chroma, I can take all of the colors out of the grain, make it more neutral looking. If I want to, I can take the grain out of the sky completely and just have it in the shadows and midtones. I mean, you can do whatever you want. It's pretty great. So you can edit the size of your grain here and the amount of grain that you have here I and mean, there's so much you can do typically i'll just stick with the 65 250 or the 65 50 because i think those look really clean so halation halation is an issue with the film strip where a lot of the red hues would bounce back into the backing layer of the film and they've corrected that over time but now that we have it it just looks good and it adds like a warm cast on the highlights and on the skin it makes the skin very appealing so like I said in my review, a flaw has turned into an aesthetic that we, that I love. I'll just put it that way. So once I enable this, I'm usually gonna do 35 or 65. You also have the option of no remjet. That's the protective layer. Uh, when you don't have remjet, the look is just super, super intense. Um, I, I mean, it's so easy to overdo. I mean, that looks kind of like a sci-fi film. It's kind of sick actually. <laughs> But I like to do around 35 and then what I can do is go into mask mode and see what it's affecting so if I go no rem jet I can see everything that's going on here if I go to 35 it doesn't look like anything's happening but as you can see it's adding that warm cast to the highlights which looks so nice it makes it look like it's a sunset and it's adding a nice cast to the skin as well so once I find one that I like it's typically 35 super 35 you can go to custom and again there are just so many parameters that you can play around with. The answer is amazing that way. All right, I usually don't touch these because I just like the presets. Again, simplicity for me. All right, coming down to Bloom, I'm gonna enable this and you can see it's adding a nice touch to those hard edges. A lot of the time I don't use Bloom just because I have a Promist on my lenses and it's really easy to overdo it. If you're going for that look, more power to you. But once you find a look, obviously you can go to mask mode and see what it's doing. So you can see where it's really being affected. That's a lot. Looks really, really nice though. So I might add a little bit of bloom to here and then I'll come to custom and start to play with some of these parameters. Just limit it a little bit. I like the detail. 
just bring the diffusion down a touch and a simple change, but looks nice. After bloom, we have these three effects down here, film damage, film breath, and gate weave. If you're trying to go for that authentic look, so say you want your footage to look like it was shot on a Super 8 camera with eight millimeter film, 16 millimeter film, it's gonna have a lot of these. So film damage is gonna add these little artifacts on here. And again, you can come into here once you find the one that you want. Eight millimeters, much more pronounced. And you can even dial in the hairs, the dust, the scratches, it's, it's crazy. All right, I'm gonna turn this off because I don't usually use it. Let's just come up here, disable. Film breath is when in the chemical process, some of the strips would be developed a little bit too long and other strips would be de developed at a proper time and then others like too short of a time. And so we get this differentiating effect where it's leaning warm, it's leaning blue and it's kind of going back. So the smaller the millimeter, the much more pronounced it's gonna be. And again, you can go to custom and really dial it in if you want to. And finally, gate weave. Gate weave is when the film strip was swinging within the camera chamber. So you can see here, it just adds a little bit of sway to the shot. So these three I'll combine together. Look like this. And again, extra effects. I'll take them. Vignette is cool. You can really center your image, change the size. Change the aspect ratio. All right, I'm just funneling attention down into the center. So here's our beginning look, and here's our end look. At the end of the day, I can check false color to see if I have overexposed highlights, which is awesome. Got false color LUT here. I can see what's, you know, in the deep blacks, I can see what might be overexposed, such as this light here, and I can come in, go back up to expand and dial it in if I want to. So I'm gonna take that off. Clipping indication is also great. It's gonna show me those areas that are gone. It's gonna either put red or blue on those areas. And one of the coolest things that a lot of people don't talk about is the LUT generator. You can take your look that you just made and take off the halation, the grain, the bloom, and use it as a reference LUT for whenever you're shooting. Say I'm in the same situation again. I like this look. I can put it on my reference monitor. It's like the coolest thing. It's so simple too. You just hit normal or small and then hit export LUT and add it to your camera, it's simple. All right, now we've made a color grade for our shot with B-Raw, but what about a shot that doesn't have raw capabilities? Well, I have a Fuji in F-Log, this biker guy, and I was in a train just making these fast intercut transitions. I can apply the start here grade, and once in Dehancer, I can come to choose camera, Fuji film, XT3, even though it's not XT4, it's all right, it still looks good, and F-Log. And then look at that, I'm already at a really good starting point. So as we can see down here, Camera Raw is no longer with us because we're not using raw controls anymore, unfortunately. So in that case, we're going to, within the Dehancer window, we're gonna use these input controls to adjust our basic primaries. And the reason we do that is because Dehancer recommends using these over the nodes because these controls are affecting the source clip right before it's inputted into Dehancer. It's just, it's gonna be a cleaner option than adjusting the nodes. So you're probably asking why are these here? So sometimes using sliders is just not as effective as, as using the primary color wheels down here. This is how I learned how to do it. And so sometimes I'm just gonna do it this way. You know, in my contrast wheel, I can and put the gain in the, in the lift and I can, I can adjust these the way I want to. And um, yeah, it's just, it's up to you. Sometimes you're just gonna highlight these, hit Command D, get rid of them, or even delete them. But they're there just in case you want to use them. It might give a similar result to this, but Dehancer recommends their own, their own tools. All right, now say you have a shot, you have no idea what camera it was shot on, you don't know what codec it was using, it, it's not ProRes, it, it's, what is it? We can still convert that into Rec. 709. I'm gonna show you how to do that now. All right, so I'm gonna take my template grade again. I'm gonna start here, apply the grade, awesome. So that's already input Dehancer on here. So our source is selected as Rec. 709. That's when our color space transform comes in. I'm gonna hit Command D on the color space transform. 
these are absolutely essential to color grading in Resolve. It, it lets us take wide color spaces and trim it down to smaller ones so we can grade in plugins like Dehancer. It lets us convert red raw to airy raw to B raw to F log. It just, you can really take any color space and move it into another, hence the name color space transform. All right, so let's go up to effects and I'm going to search color space transform and place it here. So our input color space, remember we're in DaVinci wide gamut. So I'm gonna type in DaVinci and select wide gamut. Input gamma, we're in intermediate, DaVinci intermediate. Okay, for our output color space, we're gonna do rec 709. And for our gamma, we're gonna do gamma 2.4, okay. So what we did here is we've taken our timeline that's in DaVinci wide gamut and intermediate and we're telling it to convert that into Rec. 709. And then we're inputting that Rec. 709 footage into Dehancer and we're ready to start grading just like we did before. All right, and then, you know, I can change this up. I might make this 50B and start to play around, but you get the idea. And again, this is if you don't know where your footage is from, what it was shot on, you can just simply save this as a still and apply it to any footage that you have that's a mystery and you're good to go. So now that we have our grade, let's go ahead and apply it to other clips. This guy's cracking me up over here. All right, so I'm gonna right click on this frame. I'm gonna grab a still and then in gallery, I'm gonna label this grade one. So just, we, we know what we're doing. You can apply that to other shots in your sequence that are in the same area, the same color temp, all of that stuff. So I'm gonna take this other shot that I filmed at the same temple area Drag this in and I'm going to apply that grade to this shot. All right. And it's already at a pretty good starting point. So I'm just going to dial this in. I might bring the, the whites down a little bit up the highlight roll off, bring the whites down, contrast down a little bit and start to dial in some of these parameters. So this grade isn't going to work with every shot. So say I have, this shot of this mother and son eating ice cream. <laughs> I go to color, I apply this grade and man, you know, high contrast. I'm still shooting in raw. So what I'm gonna do is bring this up to 3200 and then bring my ISO up to 3200. All right, now we have a decent exposure, which is great. I don't think this film stock works well with this shot. I want to make it more saturated. I want to bring up the shadows a little bit. So I might make this Kodak Portra, bring some of the saturation back in the rest of the tones. Then I might either go Kodak Glossy or maybe the Fuji print uh, or maybe even Lanier. I just like the saturation in this shot. So I might go Kodak Glossy because I like the way that the skin tones are rendered there. So down the raw controls, I might bring up my black level a little bit. Dial it in just a touch. And then I'm gonna bring the white down. All right. And I'm gonna come in here and start to play with the gamma. Gamma correction, I'm gonna bring those mid-tones up, bring the black level up a little bit more. And then add a little bit more contrast Okay, so we're at a decent point. There you go. So I can save this as a still, label this as grade two. All right, so now that we have our grade created as a still here, I'm gonna show you how to apply that to multiple different clips in a timeline. All right, so I'm gonna go to my edit tab. As you can see, I have just a grouping of clips at night that I like, and some clips at a temple. All right, so I'm gonna go to back to color. And what I can do is I can highlight all of these by clicking and then holding shift all the way over and I can right click and hit apply grade and boom, there it is on every shot. And I'll go back in and dial it individually here. But I think it's a good starting point for a lot of these shots. So these shots over here were filmed in the same area, same time of day. And so these looks are gonna look so much better. But 
you know, I have a great starting point for the city. It's already super filmic looking. I like the warm tones and the shadows like reflecting on the street. I like how saturated it is. It just looks really nice and it's a great starting point. Another way to do it is to take all of these shots within a group. I'm just gonna do these two. I'm gonna right click and create a group. So add into a new group, I'll call it temple. Okay, and once you have your group, you're gonna see little green links right here. These clips are now linked together and you have access to your pre-clip and your post-clip. What I can do if I want to apply the look to all of these shots, I go to post-clip and I can apply grade here. So now it's gonna apply the grade to both of these shots because their post-clips are tied together. So whenever I make a change in here, I'll just add some blue it's going to also affect this shot. They're gonna be tied together. But say you have just some changes you wanna make in one or the other, all right? So I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna come over to the clip section right in between, and then I can do whatever change I need, and the other clip will not be affected because the clips are, are independent of, of each other. But post clip, all of those changes are tied together. Hope that makes sense. All right, so I'm gonna reset this. There we go. So another way to apply a grade to multiple shots is in the edit tab. So I'm gonna come up to effects here and I'm gonna search adjustment clip and drag a little clip above my clips over here. I'm gonna drag in over these three in the city. All right, I'm gonna select it here and now I can see that it selected it in my color tab in the adjustment clip. So if timeline isn't turned on, I'm gonna turn timeline on so I can see, okay, my playhead is selecting the adjustment clip on the timeline. All right, now once I have adjustment clip selected, I can right click and apply the grade to that clip. And now all three shots underneath are affected. Say I wanna drag this over all of my footage. You can do that, get some crazy looks, but I just wanna group these three together without making groups and all of that. If you wanna take a grade that you've made and just apply it to your entire timeline, you can do that as well. You can just make changes within your timeline section over here on the node trees. So I can hit option S, change this to deep blue. As you can see, blue has been added to all of these other clips in the timeline. So I'm gonna reset that. Another hidden trick in Resolve that I absolutely love to do is change the aspect ratio on the fly. So say I'm demoing a project and I just wanna see what it looks like in 4.3, I can hit control one if I wanna demo it in CinemaScope, I can hit Control-5, see it in widescreen, and it just changes the look and the feel so much. It's just fun to demo. So I just learned this recently, but the reason that we like film images so much is not because the colors are more saturated, it's because those colors are more dense. So deep red, sometimes in digital, can lean kinda of orange. Um, with color density, that red, it gets super saturated, super beautiful and we can replicate that within our primary grades right here. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. I'm gonna type in Dehancer here, apply that, and we'll just get a basic grade set up. I know I shot on Blackmagic, so I'm gonna select Blackmagic. Awesome, make sure my, yep, my ISOs match well here. Looks good, I'm gonna change this to 50D Kodak Vision 350D, get some of those colors back, not as high contrast. And then for the print, I might go to Kodak Glossy because I just like how that looks. All right, real quick, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit to adjust the framing here. All right, I'll go back to color. And as you can see, looks pretty good. The red is, looks like red, right? After I come here and I bring up the color density, you can see how that red gets really deep. I love that. So there's another color density up here within film compression. I'm gonna enable that and I'm gonna sling that up a little bit. All right, so again, here it is without. Okay, and then here it is without in our highlights. This is affecting our highlights, it looks great. I can further do this. All right, so I can come to the saturation density node and what I'm gonna do is come into my curves here. Within these little toggles, I'm gonna come to hue versus luminance. I'm gonna select this, so I'm gonna grab my reds. 
So as you can see, this spike right here, it's definitely the pot. And what I can do is I can drag this down deeper and deeper until I make that red super, super dense. I'm gonna show you before and after. So I'm gonna grab a still, come with the gallery. I'm gonna play that still and disable this and we'll see it before and after. So that's without the dense node and that's with the red just becomes super deep, super dense. So yeah, that's density in film and the answer. There's so much here and there's still so much more to talk about. If you stayed to this part of the video, I hope that was valuable to you and you can get right in using this node tree like this if and only if you found it valuable. If you wanna get 10% off at checkout for Dehancer, you've decided you want it, go ahead and use coupon code Colin Osbury at checkout. The team at Dehancer was kind enough to give that to you guys and to support me. So each time one of you guys buys it, I get a kickback and it helps the channel and it helps me personally. So the couple of you guys who've already done that, thank you so much. That means so much to me. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. See you in the next one.